welcome friends to this two day event in Dubai, UAE. I am very happy to visit Dubai again and to see so many familiar faces here and also a number of new faces. I welcome you all to this two day event. My purpose of coming here and talking to you is to share the teachings of my master, great master, Azul Maharaj Baba Sahib Singh. Whatever he taught worked for me and I hope that by sharing these teachings with you, for those of you who are interested in the spiritual path, it will help you also. The message is very simple and has been expressed by all the saints, all the mystics of all religions, of all cultures. And the message is, if you want to find the ultimate truth about yourself and about your creator, it can be found only within yourself and not outside. A simple message. Go within as you will find the truth about yourself, who you are and who your creator is. You will also know that when you find your creator inside you, that is the place you belong to. That is from where we all came and that is our true home, which we sometimes call as such cut true home. That is where we all belong. The method of going within has been explained many times by all these saints. And they say that the only obstacle to going within yourself, traveling with your own attention, is your mind that is constantly thinking of outside things. The mind is desiring things outside, is attaching itself to things outside. Therefore, we have no obstacle in our way to our true home except our own mind. This mind has been given to us as a very precious attachment to our consciousness. We are consciousness, life. We create life in anything and that is called a soul that can create life in any form. All the trees you see around us are also life. They are living trees, they grow. Insects grow, birds grow, animals grow. All these are life forms and each one of these life forms has a soul, the principle which creates life and it is all of us, all of the living creatures. It's also in higher creatures which we do not see on the physical level here, such as gods who we worship as creators of this universe, angels who live in higher places, heavens where other souls are living. All those are different forms of life. A list has been compiled of these forms of life in the Indian scriptures. It's a very long list. They call it the list of Chirasi Lakh. 8.4 million forms of life have been lift, listed there. More than half of those forms are in plant kingdom. And many of them are in forms which are starting from insects to birds and animals. And those that have not been discovered subspecies and those that have already died out, all of them are listed in the big list. The last 400,000 includes the human being as a form. It also includes the angels and so-called gods that we worship who create and destroy this universe. Many of us have heard of the creative power of Brahma, the sustaining power of Vishnu, the killing power, destroying power of Shiva, these three are names given by one religion to a principle which says everything that has been created here has a beginning, a middle and an end. The names for the beginning, middle and end have been called by these names of Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. Other religions have called them by different names. But the truth is that nothing that you can see in these planes of existence like the physical plane where we are sitting now, they all have a beginning, they all live for a certain time and they all die. 
including the planets, they die too, including the stars and universes, they die too. There is mention of grand revolution that take place where even the created universes all die. And are finished and a new set of universes comes into being. So that is why everything that we see here has a beginning, a middle and an end. So what is the warning? All creation is the essence of this tree. The essence is time. The time creates all. Supposing there was no time, there will be no beginning and no middle and no end. Time creates this. Time is a very powerful influence and is the biggest trap which we have caught in. The literal translation of time in the Indian Hindi language or Sanskrit language is Kaal. Kaal is time. And we sometimes have been given the notion that Kaal is a negative power and probably some devil sitting somewhere working. Kaal is this very negative power of time that holds us here. There is no time in our true home. There is no space in our true home. These are instruments used to create the local experiences of three worlds. First of all, it's the physical world we are all living in now, where I am talking to you, where you are listening to me. This is the physical world, we have physical bodies and in the physical body resides our life and that is why it's called the physical universe and everything here is made up of matter. Matter and energy interplay to create a physical world and they spin in time. Without time they won't exist. There is a higher form of life also where we need not have our physical bodies. Sometimes we call this body physical as asthul sharir, which means one that is made of matter. And we also have inside this asthul sharir another body which is called suksham sharir or astral body. Suksham means fine and astral means relating to another sky, not this sky, not physical sky. So when we talk about the astral form of life, what is it actually? Is it some other place where we have to go to see it? Not at all. It's right here where we are sitting. If we did not have our astral forms, we would not be alive in the physical form. If we did not have an astral form, we would not be able to see with these eyes, not touch with these hands, not hear with our ears. All sense perception that we are attributing to the physical body actually belong to the inner body. Can we have access to it? We are having access to it every day. People think we have to do a lot of meditation to find our suksha shri or astral body, not at all. Every time you close your eyes and imagine something and you see it, these eyes are closed. How are you seeing? only astral eyes can see. The perception of sight, vision, is not physical. It's built into us. Even if we did not have the body, it would still be functional. But since we are using that power through the body, we are associating it with these physical eyes. That these eyes are seeing. But how do we use our eyes in the dream when we see so many things in dreams these eyes are closed, yet we can see. In imagination, we can see. In imagination, we can touch, taste, smell, do everything that we do with the sense perceptions in this physical body. So remember, the astral body is working with us right now. Only we are captured in this physical form because of the material, physical atoms and molecules required to build a physical form. The matter is the only addition to make this physical form. If the physical form does not exist or we are not experiencing it, the astral form still functions. We go to sleep at night and we are unaware of physical body. The dream body is running around everywhere. Where is that coming from? The same astral self is creating the dreams, 
The same astral self can be used in all imagination, all great creations, all art and literature has come from there, all scientific adventures have come from there, new inventions have come from there, it's all being picked up, all imagination is coming from there. It's all being picked up from a body that exists inside us and operates through the physical body so long as we have matter attached to it. That's all. So matter is the physical matter that creates this physical life for us. Once we are in a physical body, the sense perceptions get confined to a reality which is physical reality. So that is why we think this physical world is the only reality because we are sitting in a physical body. If we were not sitting in a physical body, we would see another world. We see a world where matter does not really have any importance. We can see things which are non-material. We can see energy, we can see colors, we can see things which we cannot see now. Right now, they say that there are telephones ringing out of Dubai, millions per second are going. You know when you ring a telephone to a friend of yours, a wireless message goes to the tower and the tower sends messages all over the world. You have dialed a number in India, you dialed a number in USA, the phone doesn't know where it is, where you are dialing. It does not send a direct message to where your number you are dialing. It sends a message in all directions. And where the number can pick up the frequency, that rings back. Therefore, there are wireless messages going through us and through this hall right now, millions of them per second, which people are listening and talking to each other. Can we see them? No. Why can't we see them? because we are confined to a physical body that can only see matter. But if you are not in that body, you will be able to see those too. As you can see that there is a lot of energy going through different shapes and forms which is creating communications on the physical plane. So that is why it's a very great thing of importance to know that the sense perceptions are operating inside this physical body to make them available to us in a material way. When we die in the physical body, what happens? Do we really die? Or do the sense perceptions remain intact? It's a good question. People who have died can tell us, but they are dead, they can't talk to us. Therefore, the mystics have found, the saints have found a method by which you can test that if you die, Will you still be living somewhere in a different body? And that particular process is called dying while living. That means you can have the experience of death, complete experience of death, what will happen when you physically die while you are still living now. That's a very big possibility for us to know what happens after death. We are so afraid what will happen after death just because we never check out. That it is possible for us right now to test out what will happen to us when this body dies. Will there be something remaining? Will life still be there? Will the astral body still be there? Will our mind still be functioning? Will thoughts still be there? It's a good question. Therefore, a method has been suggested by all the saints that what makes us alive is our attention. A living attention that makes us know that we have hands and feet, we have a body and we have a world around us. Supposing we don't put attention on anything, we won't have the experience of these things. We have a consciousness which is life. If we were not conscious, we would be unconscious, we don't have any experience at all. First thing is consciousness, that we have to be conscious. Then consciousness means the potential for being aware of anything. We are conscious in another city. We are not looking at it now, we are not visiting it now, but we are conscious that another city exists, another country exists, stars exist, we are not looking at them. 
but we are conscious of them. So consciousness does not mean that you should be knowing at the same time. That limited knowing of something is called awareness. So awareness is part of consciousness, a small part of consciousness. Consciousness is the potential for having unlimited awareness. And when we have some awareness, we get confined to that awareness which we are having right now. We are aware that I am talking, you are listening and we are here gathered for a meeting. This is awareness. We know the size of this hall, we know where we are sitting. That's awareness. Now, awareness is what is immediately available to us from consciousness. But within awareness, there is a small section we can pick up to increase our awareness of that through attention. For example, I can see a cup of water next to me and I want to put attention on the water very clear. It was lying on one side, I was not aware, I was conscious of it. Now I am even aware and when I look at the water and concentrate my attention on it, I can see every part of the water and the lemon in it and probably not be careful who is sitting there. Otherwise I was aware who was sitting there. This is a very great, wonderful experience gifted to us that we can narrow down our experience of awareness by using our attention. Whenever we place our attention, that becomes our limited awareness. Right now, we are using our awareness in a very generalized, scattered way. We don't concentrate it. When we read a book, we concentrate our attention to understand the book, to understand what we are reading. If you just keep a book in front of you and pay attention to other things, nothing makes sense. So attention has to be used to make sense of things. We are placing our attention all the time on our body. We have got hand, we have got feet, we have got the body, we have got head, we have got this. We are conscious of the whole body structure. We are conscious when we are hungry, we are conscious of the functioning of the body. Our consciousness and the attention scattered in the body creates our perception of the body. And when we have perception of physical body, it creates through the sense perception, perception of a world around us. Now, let us imagine that we reverse the flow of attention. Right now, our attention is constantly going outside. Desiring things, getting attached to things, desiring more, same things, getting more attached to things, remembering them all the time in our head, remembering what job we have to do, remembering our children, our parents, remembering our friends, our business, constantly putting attention on so many things all outside of our body. Then what is the meaning of the saints and mystics saying go within? We are going without, we are going outside all the time. What, what would happen if instead of putting our attention all on outside things, we pulled our attention inside? Can we do it? Yeah, we do it all, many times. If you close your eyes and imagine, imagination is also one of your very good gifts to give it to you because when you imagine something, you can put attention there. Supposing I were to tell you, imagine you are sitting on top of this building. Most of you will be easily able to imagine you are on top, although you are sitting here, imagining you are there. Similarly, if you can imagine that you are not sitting outside, you are not sitting in the chair, but sitting inside in the head. Such simple thing. If you can imagine that you are sitting inside the head, why inside the head? Why not inside the arm? Why not in the hand? Because when we look at ourselves, where are we thinking from? Where are we deciding to talk from? It's all in the head. We are not using our hands and legs and feet for that. We are not using our torso for that. We are using the head for everything. All thoughts are coming from here. We are looking at the eyes which are placed right in the head. We are not placed on our knees. They are placed right here to see outside. Ears have been placed right here close to the head. It looks that like our sense perceptions which are the most important, seeing and listening, are all placed very close to the head. 
not only close, if you were to take this part of the body, the head, and consider that this part, the forehead and the top part of the head only, not the nose and mouth and all, only this top part, the eyes, ears, include them, and imagine you are sitting at this level behind the eyes, between the ears and the head. Not difficult. You just sit. The location is only imagination. It's only imagining that you are sitting inside the head. If you can do that, to imagine you are sitting inside the head, right in the center, not on the side, not towards one ear or the other ear, or in front of the eyes or behind the head, in the center. That means, supposing I were to draw, and using a geometry now for you, I have to draw two lines from my eyes back. Then I draw a line between my ears. Two lines going this, one line intersecting, the middle of that line is the center. Very clear. If you can feel my imagination that you are sitting in the center there, what would happen? I am simple question. If you have tried it, very good. If you haven't, you might like to try and I tell you what happens. That place is the place from where you are thinking right now. That place is so important, it has been called the third eye. We have two eyes, but we are now sitting in the middle, between the two eyes and behind the eyes. It's very interesting that why have you got two eyes? Why not one eye? You could have had one eye in the center. The two eyes are doing a very important function. They see two different pictures. They cannot see the same picture. We are using two eyes to see two things. And then we make them one. Which creates space. Which creates distance. Otherwise there will be no distance. We have two ears. We could have one ear. One ear would never have told us which direction the sound is coming from. Two ears divides it and we hear the sound differently in the two ears and establishes the direction. Space and time are functioning by the simple device of two eyes, two ears. It's wonderful. But when we see two pictures, where are we combining the two? We want to see each other, we see only one picture. If we put our finger in front of us and look at a distance, we see two fingers. One is generally more predominant than the other, so the two eyes are seeing two fingers. If we look at the finger, other people become two. So this is a very great effect being created by us by using two images in these eyes and we are not seeing through these eyes. Because then we will see two. We are seeing one. Where do we combine these? Just spend a moment, you'll find we are combining the two images at the very point which I call third eye center. We are already using third eye center every day. And many people who are practicing meditation, who have read books, tell me, we are searching for many years for third eye center. And I give them a reply, you are searching from third eye center, how can you not find it? If you were to go somewhere to find it, I would have said, please go there. You cannot search except from third eye center. You cannot be awake and see the world except from third eye center. You are in the third eye center. They know the place. Then what's the problem? That's what you find. Third eye center is where we are in a state of wakefulness. When we are awake, we are in third eye center. Only requirement is that from third eye center, we are scattering our attention in the whole body and identifying ourselves in the physical body. Supposing you say, this physical body is not me, for a moment. I am not suggesting forever, but for a little while. Imagine this physical body is not me, it's a house I live in. Let's think this body is a house, and our real self, which is functioning in the head, is the real self of ours, and functioning from the third eye center. And we then imagine sitting there, Imagine sitting where we are already sitting. We don't have to go anywhere. And we don't have to imagine a little 
picture of ours, close the visor, see how such it is. If you make a picture, the picture will always be in front of you. It cannot be where you are. And a lot of people make that mistake in meditation. When they want to place themselves in third eye center, they make a picture of themselves and begin seeing it. I have often sat with them in meditation and said, where are you now? Are you at the third eye center behind the eyes? They said, yes, we can see ourselves. And I said, okay, let's do an experiment now. If you're seeing yourself sitting there, you know, with your hands, you can touch your eyes whenever you like. It's just so easy, just touch me. No, even with closed eyes, you can touch your eyes. You know where they are. Okay, now, if you're sitting there and you can see yourself, bring your hands with your eyes closed very slowly and you will see before you touch your eyes, you cross the image which you are seeing. You are not making the image inside, you are making the image outside. Big mistake. Thinking that by making an image of yourself, you are entering the third eye center. No! From where you are seeing the image is the third eye center. Therefore, that's a very, very important step if you want to examine who you are and do what is called dying while living, that you don't have to imagine any image of yours, but imagine you are there. That you are lifted up yourself from this chair, which is a body now, only a house, and gone into the place inside your head. I was initiated very young by the great master. I had a problem about this. So I went to him and I said, Master, how can we, how can we sit there? It's very difficult to imagine that. He gave me a simple example. He said, you are sitting on a chair now. Raise your hand, put your index finger up high, which you can't see. Imagine that you are raising yourself physically above. Can you see yourself floating? I can imagine that. I can imagine I'm floating up, floating up. Have you now sat down on top of the finger? The whole of me. And that I can imagine. Okay, now bring it slowly down. He did this experiment with me. Bring it slowly down. Are you still there? I can see, I can feel I'm there, not here. Okay, come here, jump inside. I jumped, I was there. I was there where I was. But the body was not. There, my imaginary, imaginary body was there. That's the secret. That you have to put your imaginary self, not see anything, be there. Be where they already are. Only thing is that we don't have a scattered attention in the body and we can be there. If you can stay there for a little while, you will know the value of that experience and you will know that is the body that does not die when this body dies. Such a simple thing. We have made it so complicated. People talk in terms like astral plane is somewhere we have to go. They show charts to me. There is a physical plane, top is astral plane, then comes other plane, then this thing. And far away I look at the sky, where are we going? It's all inside. Nothing is outside. That is why the first step, if you want to know, what happens after we die? You can all know it. With a simple experiment I tell you. That imagine you have lifted yourself up from the physical space you are sitting in up to the place behind the eyes from where you are thinking, from where you are talking, from where you are making imagination. Just go there and do anything you want there. You want to dance, dance there. You want to sing, sing there. Not with this mouth, in the mouth, an imaginary mouth. Do everything there. When I have my meditation workshops and we do actual meditation, people are surprised by the ease with which they can go to their astral form and fly in the sky, fly even the physical sky and the astral sky. There is not an overlap that we have experiences. This is a wonderful world so created. That life has been placed in our, this physical body in three stages. It's not directly that the soul is sitting in the body. The soul is sitting inside the astral body. 
Not only that, the astral body is also a cover to inner body which is even higher. And that is from where thoughts come. We say, I am thinking. You don't think. Life does not think. Mind thinks. We have been given a mind. Very precious thing. Mind is such a beautiful thing given to us that we can think with it, rationalize, make sense, understand. So many wonderful things we can do with the mind. It was given to us to use for these purposes. But we are not using it for these purposes. What are we using the mind for? To create doubts and to create fear. It's a, that's not the purpose. Doubt was supposed to be a screening device. He said, don't be vulnerable to anything somebody says you believe it. It's a check. It's a test. It's a very good thing built into the mind to have a doubt, to have a skeptic mind, to not accept anything anybody says. Check it out. And have personal experience to believe it. Every purpose of using the mind that way. We are not using the mind. Mind is using us. Mind tells us what to do. Thoughts tell us what to do. Instead of we telling the thoughts what to think, instead of we telling the mind what to think, what to do, mind is telling us all the time. We have become slaves of a mind which was supposed to be our slave. Supposed to be of service to us. And the surprising thing is, if you put your attention inside, not only will you know that you have an astral body which has all the sense perceptions, that you think this physical body has. But you can meditate in the same way within the astral body inside and discover that you have an inner body called the mind. Mind is a body also. Mind is structured around the soul. Mind is structured around life, around consciousness. To be available to consciousness to think. To create time and space to think. It does not need it. The mind creates it for us. What a wonderful thing it is. We don't make use of the mind. We are being used by the mind. Big problem. We have created an opposite relationship with the mind. Instead of using it the way we like, we are mental will is our dictator now. We should have a spiritual will. The will of the soul. So develop spiritual will. Tell the mind, take this, do this. You will see how beautiful the system will work. It is supposed to be like that. You were given a mind. It causes all time-space experience to be created. That's why it's called the causal mind, the causal body. It causes everything. The mind causes all experiences that we can think of in time and space. The mind then, after creating, puts them into sense perceptions through the astral self. And this package goes into the physical self to create physical experiences of great variety. All this variety is being created by the combination of these three covers upon our soul. It's like wearing three layers of clothing, each serving its own purpose. The soul wears around it a mind and start thinking in time space. The soul wears the astral self and divides perception into five different forms of perception, sense perceptions, where the physical body creating a physical world and we have physical experiences. So beautifully arranged. We can do reverse, reverse engineering to the same thing. Now, that's the key. I said, if you put your attention at the third eye center and stay there, that means think of everything as happening there, nothing outside. Anything you want to build, you want to decorate your room, decorate that room. I call it the decoration of the sixth floor. Because our physical body functions through energies and the energy centers. The six chakras they call are simply energy centers located in the physical body, starting from the rectum, below the genitals, the navel, the digestive system, the heart, the throat, and the eyes. These are the six centers of energy. Energetic centers provide all the energies for us to live here. They are very good. If I were to say this body of mind is a house, we are all living in a house, it's a six floors, six floors of different energetic centers. So we are at the sixth floor in a wakeful state. When we are awake, 
we are sitting in the sixth floor automatically. Then decorate that place. Make it beautiful. Put the best carpet, best furniture, put drapes on windows. Do everything there. It's such an interesting thing to do meditation. To build up your place for, for real worship, for real finding your own self. You can decorate as much. And no dirhams and dollars are required for that. It's all your imagination. But you can make it so beautiful that you would love to go there. Otherwise, what's happening? My friends who've been initiated for 40, 50 years are still doing the same thing. Like it's a ritual. Like we just to do it for two and a half hours or whatever. Nobody can do two and a half hours. It's very difficult. But they're trying to because they were told. They made a religion, a religious ceremony out of meditation. That was not the purpose at all. The purpose of meditation is to meditate on the self and discover who you are. So unless you do that, the rest is just a waste of time. We can waste a whole life by not understanding what we are supposed to be finding by going in. It's not a ritual. It's a practice to discover your own self. If you follow, you can find it. So develop your inner chambers the way you meditate. Great master told me that do not start any process of meditation such as repeating mantras, words, similar. Do not start repetition unless you have first seated yourself at third extent. He said people make this mistake that they start repeating the words which almost become like the repeating in this physical body. So the repetition should be in the mind but they have the words also, the tongue also starts moving along with the words and the physical body. If you are repeating with the physical body, you will never leave the physical body, you will always be here. Therefore, he said, first make sure you have been stationed behind the eyes at the third eye center. You feel you are there on the sixth floor of the house in the head, not sitting on the ground, not sitting in the chair. Once you establish there, then start this with the inner body, not with the physical body. Then it works. What is the purpose of repeating the words? Two purposes. That's why all mantra is being used by every religion, one form or the other. All repetition of words is being used by every religion. In every meditation, they teach how to use repetition of words. We use repetition of words in order to prevent the mind thinking too much of outside things. We are forcing the mind to think the word that we like it to think and not what the mind wants to think. That the first exercise of our spiritual will. That we are not allowing the mind to think anything. We want the mind to think the words which we have to repeat. First good action we are taking to use the mind. Because if we make the mind repeat the words, it doesn't have time to think of other things. But there have been some problems, and I want to share those with you, that people are repeating the words, and the mind is roaming around all over the world. How does that happen? Our great poet, poet Saint Kabir says, in Hindi, Mala to karme phire, jeeva phire mukhmahe, Manua to chahudesh pare, yato simran na. That we are holding the beads in our hand, repeating the words in our tongue, and not, the mind is running all over the world, don't call that simran at all. It's a waste of time. He says again that you have to repeat with the mind. Occupy the mind with those words, so the mind cannot be distracted to think of the rest of the world. Then it is proper simran. That's the main purpose. Repeating with the tongue or repeating physically thinking you are physically sitting in the body and repeating it with the mind. So I'm not good enough. If you are already knowing that you are sitting inside the head and repeating is worthwhile. That is a very big purpose. Also second purpose of the similar or the word that the perfect living masters give us. I was very happy, lucky to get initiated by a perfect living master, Baba Saavan Singh. See his photo here. And when a perfect living master, 
And I'll explain to you what that means. Initiates you, he empowers the words at that time. So that the words have extra power, which we can't see. But the power is invested and works inside our head. But the purpose is, it prevents negativity from coming near you. It's a very big thing. We are living in a negative world. We are surrounded by negative people. We go to places of work which have negativity around us. If families have negativity around us, and repeating those words keeps that negativity away from us, and we can stay positive. It's another very big benefit of the words given by a perfecting master. He put that power in those words. They are ordinary words. He can put those power in any word he likes. But generally, they choose words which should not have an external meaning, but should have some internal meaning. For example, I love a, a dish very popular in America called pizza. Pizza or pizza? And supposing my master said the only word to repeat is pizza, and I keep on saying pizza, pizza, I see pizza or the word all, over, all the time. So they will not give that kind of a word. They give words which have some significance inside. And as we travel to different levels of our own consciousness, we discover the power of those words, why they were chosen, why they were given to us. We discover the insight. But otherwise we can't know the second purpose of the repetition. But the main purpose to start with is still to not allow the mind to decide what to think, but you tell the mind what to think by repeating the words. Take control of the mind. Very difficult to control the mind. <laughs> One mistake went that far to say, if somebody says, I have drunk the water of all the oceans, it's impossible. But for one moment I believe maybe such a man has been born who can do that. For one moment I can do Somebody says I picked up all the Himalayan mountains on my head. Impossible. But for one moment I believe it. But if somebody says I've controlled my mind, no, no, never. That's what he says. It's so difficult to control the mind. And yet the devices given to us are simple enough to control the mind by knowing how to develop your spiritual will and use spiritual will to override the mental will. I'll explain to you what the two wills are so that you will know how to develop the spiritual will and what is mental will. 